morning guys. <laughs> Here's Alexander and Guy. Uh, we're gonna speak English because Guy is English speaker only. Uh, so I'm gonna present. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna present them for a while. So Guy Davidson is a principal coding manager and Creative Assembly. He's been writing games for 14 years and not gonna stop on that. Uh, he's a voting member of C++ uh, community and interested in graphics, I.O. and especially in color-related stuff in game engines, as you will see. So on another side is Alexander Pergov, who is working in JetBrains uh, for Rider for Unreal Engine nowadays, but he was FPGA engineer, game dev, game developer, and now he is making ID, I think one of the best IDs for <laughs> C++ editing <laughs> now. Uh, so welcome, guys. Good morning. Hello there. Um, I'm really stoked for this talk. Uh, this is the second time I'm working with Guy, and it's always a blast. I was really oh. uh, waiting for it. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a pre-recorded presentation from Guy that will start soon. Uh, so we are really glad that you're going to see that first because it's quite intriguing and surprising. OK, so um, yeah, let's start. Right? Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. And thank you for choosing it. Now, some of you may know that I'm a co-founder of the Hash Include Diversity and Inclusion Group for C++ Engineers. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to talk about this. The biggest problem we have in the C++ community is that there are more problems to solve than engineers to solve them. Especially at this time, we need problem solvers to work on the hard problems. Historically, software engineering has been an inclusive environment. For example, Margaret Hamilton was director of the Software Engineering Division of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Instrumentation Laboratory which developed onboard flight software for NASA's Apollo program. She is one of the people credited with coining the term software engineering. Now, however, we appear to be heavily biased towards white men and have very low gender and ethnicity diversity. We as a species need to fix this. And if you're interested in helping, please visit the website and join the Discord server. Thank you. So this is our agenda. We'll look at identifying colors, how we apprehend intensity and color. We'll look at a color, couple of color spaces and a transfer function. We'll see how color management is widely misapplied. We'll take a quick look at the linear algebra proposal. It's surprisingly relevant. Finally, we'll see how color can be used in C++ and review the proposed API. Presentations can be very dull, so I like to spice things up a little with artworks. Besides my own scribblings, on my slides, of course. I will periodically ask you to identify works and submit your answers to the chat, just to check that you're all still awake. So, any guesses who painted this uh, piece? Extra points for the correct name. It is, of course, Jackson Pollock. This is number 34, which he painted in 1949. Now, you should know where the chat window is and how to ask questions, and I will attempt to answer questions as we go. So let's get started with another quiz. Quiz time. Please put your answers in the chat. Are you ready? According to the PowerPoint color picker, what color is this? Well, it's white, isn't it? What colour is this? Well, that's clearly red, isn't it? What about this? What colour is this? Looks like green to me. What colour is this? Well, that's blue, and I'm pretty sure you're getting the hang of this now, aren't you? What colour is this? Well, 
Yes, it's yellow. And this... Of course, it's purple. How about this? Well, apparently it's teal, T-E-A-L, but I would call it turquoise or aquamarine. What colour is this? Well, allegedly this is orange. It would have taken me several guesses to get to that colour. So let's talk about colorimetry. The problem we have is one of subjectivity and context, the root of all ambiguity. Subjectivity is a pain in the rear. It is the home of opinions and the enemy of engineering. It carries with it out of band information in the form of context. In the prior example, the out of band information was that the viewers were standing in different places and their answer depended on which position they were occupying. And this would change their viewpoint. And this is very much like life itself and argument on the internet. So how do we eliminate subjectivity? Well, the obvious, though not very useful answer, is that we only consider objective criteria. We only look at those things that are agreed to be independent of viewpoint. For example, if I spread my arms, just like this, the distance between the tips of my middle fingers, which are now off camera, is 1.9 metres. And nobody can really argue about that. We have a definition of a metre, and if we apply it 1.9 times to the distance between the tips of my middle fingers, we cover it perfectly. You can try arguing with me, but I would quickly discard you as a troll. The secret here is measuring according to an accepted standard. Everyone accepts the metre, even the Americans. But what about colour? How do we measure human vision? Well, the first thing we need to observe is that perception is logarithmic. Differences at low levels are more significant than differences at high levels. And this is fundamental to behaviour. It's evolutionarily advantageous. If you're being tracked by a predator, hearing a footstep in near silence is valuable. If 30 beasts are chasing you, hearing a 31st isn't valuable information. The same is true of sight. If you perceive the amount of light cast by a single bulb, and then suddenly another bulb lights up, the effect is noticeable and will consume your attention. On the other hand, if you perceive the amount of light cast by eight bulbs, adding another one isn't going to make much difference to you. This is about the difference between contrast and brightness. Contrast is more useful than absolute brightness. Mechanical vision is linear. Now, I've put vision in quotes because it's not really vision. It's photons hitting a CCD. See, this is a diagram of a CCD chip. Vision is about apprehension understanding, parsing, contextualising. That's why it's logarithmic, because that's what is most useful. Machines just count photons using natural numbers. Actually, they take a sample, uh, rather than counting the entire number of photons. That seems like a bit of a big ask. The interesting information is at the dark end. Remember, contrast, not brightness, is what's important. To improve sampling at that end of things, we store the square root rather than the value. This gives us more values at the bottom in exchange for fewer, fewer values at the top. I'm overgeneralizing here just a little bit, of course. It's not the square root. It's in fact x to the power of somewhere between the reciprocal of 1.8 and the reciprocal of 2.2. This number is called the gamma value. So more on this in a moment. Low gamma samples more evenly across the spectrum than high gamma. Low gamma is good for bright pictures, high gamma for darker pictures. You store the gamma correction out of band in your data so that you can decode it properly. OK, quiz fans, who is this? This is Ophelia, painted by John Everett Millet. There is a girls' school near my studio named after him. Anyway, what about colour? There are two kinds of light-sensitive cells in the eye, rods and cones. 
Rods apprehend lower intensities, while cones apprehend brighter signals and also specialise over particular electromagnetic frequency ranges. There are in fact three types of cones specialising in different ranges. They are labelled S, M and L for short, medium and long wavelength. As you can see from the picture, the S cones respond to shorter wavelengths, peaking at 420 nanometers, and there are fewer of them. They make up about 2% of the cones in the human eye, in fact. The M cones make up about a third, peaking at 530 nanometers, and the L cones make up the majority, and they peak at the longer wavelength of 580 nanometers. You can see red, green and blue as the primary colors here. Three types of cone makes humans trichromats, although originally we were tetrachromats until genetic mutation got in the way. I've heard it suggested that Van Gogh was probably a tetrachromat. Interestingly, women are much more likely to be tetrachromats than men, but they are non-functional tetrachromats. There has only been one documented example of a functional tetrachromat. She was found in 2016. So, with three cones being the general case, we only need a vector of three values to represent all human vision. What we need is a way of transforming these electromagnetic emissions into perceived colour. So to do this, you must take a standard human, put them in a standard environment, measure how they perceive electromagnetic waves via matching the colours of lights, build a function that maps electromagnetic wavelengths to human perception, giving three values, x, y, z. Then constrain this function so that all values are positive and luminance ranges from 0 to 100. And this was first attempted in a series of experiments in the late 1920s. These results were combined by the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, in English that's the International Commission on Illumination, into the CIE RGB colour space, from which the CIE XYZ colour space was derived. Not all values are possible. The ranges overlap. For example, S and L cannot both be zero. Engineering is messy in real life. The vector space defined by this colour space contains impossible values. Now, we apprehend brightness separately from colour. So let's create a colour space to reflect that. We can normalise the values so that we have two values representing colour and a third value for relative luminance, informally known as brightness. It's important to emphasise that Y is the relative luminance by deliberate choice. Now, we have a two-dimensional colour space that we can vary by brightness. It looks like this. This is the XYY colour space, also known as the CIE 1931 colour space. The figures in blue are the wavelengths. X and Y vary between 0 and 1. This diagram displays the maximally saturated bright colours that can be produced by a monitor. The area is called the gamut of human vision. And some interesting properties emerge. All visible chromaticities correspond to non-negative values of X, Y and Z. If you choose any two points of colour on the chromaticity diagram, then all the colours that lie in a straight line between the two points can be formed by mixing these two colours. An equal mixture of two equally bright colours will not generally lie on the midpoint of that line segment. In more general terms, a distance on the CIE XY chromaticity diagram does not correspond to the degree of difference between two colours. And also, if you choose three sources, you'll get a large range of colours, but you won't get the full range of colours visible to humans, because this shape is not a triangle. There is so much more about this. Check Wikipedia for an introduction to CIE 1931 colour space. I just want to call back to the earlier discussion on how we perceive brightness. Perceptual uniformity is a property where a small change in a value has the same effect in perceived colour, regardless of what the value is. Values in this colour space are not very perceptually uniform, which makes it inefficient. There were three further attempts to actually achieve this, but they still exhibited some distortion. Now, in 1996, Microsoft and Hewlett Packard created the sRGB standard. It's a standard. The International Electrotechnical Commission formally identified this in 1999. It's often the default colour space for images that contain no colour space information, especially if the image's pixels are stored in 8-bit integers per colour channel. This colour space is designed for monitors in the World Wide Web, and as you can imagine, it is the most widely used colour space. 
sRGB defines the chromaticities of the red, green and blue primaries. The colours where one of the three channels is non-zero and the other two are zero. These primaries are defined in terms of the CIE colour space. They are based on the colours of the phosphors in cathode ray tube TV sets. And you'll remember those if you have grey hair. You might wonder if it's still relevant now that CRT devices are all but extinct. However, you can make a tri-stimulus display that conforms to sRGB without using phosphors. You can use LEDs of the same colour. You can use any materials as long as the primaries match. Let's take a look at the gamut. So the triangle is the sRGB gamut, shown within the CIE 1931 gamut. It is all the colours you can see on an sRGB monitor. Each corner of the triangle is a primary defined in XY. It defines what RG and B relate to in sRGB in terms of the absolute XYZ definition. You might be thinking to yourself, hang on, what about the colours outside the triangle? I can see those. Those colours are wrong. They are an interpretation, a representation. This image is drawn using sRGB and the truth is we can't represent those colours on an RGB monitor or projector. And don't get me started on Adobe RGB. The sRGB standard also defines a transfer function between the intensity of these primaries and the actual number stored. The function is nonlinear. And that word nonlinear is really important and I'll come back to it in a moment. The x-axis contains the stored value from 0 to 1. And if you store the value as 8-bit integers, it would be from 0 to 255. On the right-hand y-axis, also ranging from 0 to 1, you have the intensity. The red plot is the sRGB intensities versus sRGB numerical values. Behind the red curve is a dashed black curve showing an exact gamma equals 2.2 power law. As you can see, there is more detail at lower values. The upper half of the intensity spread is represented with only about a third of the stored values. On the left-hand y-axis, you have the effective local gamma. The blue plot is the function slope in log-log space, which is the effective gamma at each point. The gamma cannot be expressed as a single numerical value. The overall gamma is approximately 2.2, that grey line at the top. Particularly, 2.2 is the median value, that is the value at half intensity. However, the whole gamma range consists of a linear section near black, below a linear intensity of 0 0.00313, where gamma equals 1, and then a non-linear section elsewhere, involving a 2.4 exponent and a gamma changing from 1.0 through about 2.3. The purpose of the linear section is so the curve does not have an infinite slope at 0, which could cause numerical problems. So, what does this function look like? So, the transfer function, function is actually the two lines in the middle. The line at the top, first line, creates RGB from XYZ. And this is a simple linear transformation by the power of matrices. But that isn't enough. We then have to do the gamma correction. And this comes in two parts depending on the range. For small intensities, we simply multiply by 12.92. For larger intensities, you can see the rather unpleasant activity of taking the fifth power and then the twelfth root. The third and fourth line are the reverse operations going from RGB back to XYZ, and this is computationally expensive, I think you'll agree. Most of the time, all you want to do is convert from RGB values to a linear space so that you can interpolate. This means you don't need the matrix transformation, since that is simply another linear operation. So let's look at an implementation of the gamma correction from RGB to a linear space. C sRGB is the individual RGB value being converted between 0 and 1, and C lin is the linear target value. Now, performance is everything. And a very common approximation is to simply raise it to the power of 11 over 5. On the right-hand axis, you can see the absolute difference shaded in green. It's okay, but it's fairly inaccurate. For example, if the values are quantized to 8 bits for the sRGB component value 197, the linear output is 145 instead of 142. Can we do better? Well, simply increasing the power a little to 2.233333 
does improve overall accuracy, although it reduces accuracy slightly at lower values. Another problem is that the power function is enormously expensive. At three evaluations per pixel, for a 1 to 8 by 1 to 8 image, you're looking at nearly 50,000 calculations. Does it scale? Well, sometimes the power function isn't even available. This approximation, a cubic polynomial, is rather cheaper, rather better, and available everywhere. Going back to sRGB is rather more problematic, though. Let's look at an implementation of the gamma correction from a linear space back to sRGB. C sRGB is the target RGB value. C lin is the linear source value. The inverse of the original approximation, raising to the power of 2.2, is very poor. Fortunately, a near-perfect approximation is available where the linear part of the graph is clamped to non-negative numbers. Of course, it does use power, so you can use a polynomial again. Three square root calls should be faster than the power. Check on your platform. So, in summary, brightness perception is logarithmic. XYZ defines absolute perceptual colors. The XYY color space is linear. Linear interpolation is valid on linear color spaces. sRGB is defined relative to XYY. But the transfer function is not a linear function and it's expensive. sRGB is nonlinear, which means that linear interpolation is invalid on sRGB. Right, time for another abstract. Who painted this? Well, this is Wassily Kandinsky. Squares with concentric circles, painted in 1913. So we've taken a look at the theory of colour measurement, and we've learned about linear and non-linear colour spaces. We've learned that sRGB is non-linear. What could possibly go wrong? Here's a simple piece of interpolation. x plus y over 2. I'm trying to find the midpoint between x and y. What if the data being stored is in fact the square root? Square root of x plus square root of y over 2 is not the same as square root of x plus y over 2. Consider x equals 9 and y equals 16. In the first case, we have 3 plus 4 divided by 2, which equals 3.5. In the second case, we have the square root of 25 over 2, which equals 3.535. The incorrect calculation is darker than the correct calculation. Believe it or not, midpoint is a remarkably subtle expression and easy to get wrong. Marshall Klaus spoke about this at St. Petersburg last year and told us all about it. New for C20 is midpoint and lerp the more general version. So what does this look like in practice? Well, the top bar is a correct interpolation between red and green. The color range has been correctly transferred to a linear color space, interpolated, and then returned to the original color space. The bottom bar is an interpolation without transference. It is non-linear and looks like a sludgy mess. It is too dark in the middle and I hope you have good bandwidth, otherwise this might look a bit blurry, but it's important. That darkness in the middle is the incorrect calculation that we saw earlier. This is an 8-bit sRGB perceptually linear ramp, incorrectly taking a round trip through 8-bit linear colour. You can see that the darker colours experience severe banding, and there is a quite significant precision issue. This effect is actually known as posterization. This entails the conversion of a continuous gradation of tone to several regions of fewer tones with abrupt changes from one tone to another. You can see such an abrupt change right at the front in the leap from zero to 13. 
The leaps get smaller as intensities increase, and you will recall that sampling is at a much higher resolution at lower intensities. So you would expect the error to be much more profound at those levels. This was originally done with photographic processes to create posters with reduced colour depth. Wikipedia tells me it can now be done with digital image processing and maybe deliberate or an unintended artefact of colour quantization. It sounds like a rookie error, doesn't it? You wouldn't expect this in professional software. Sadly, I have to ask you to think again. My colleague James Barrow rolled his sleeves up and surveyed the landscape of code using colour. It was not a pretty sight and I present now his findings. Let's look at SDL, a popular cross-platform development library which provides a low-level access to PC hardware. It has a number of pixel formats. And this library features an sRGB mode which yields quantization. There was no documentation about whether the color space was linear or nonlinear. SFML is a simple and fast multimedia library a popular cross-platform development library which provides low-level access to PC hardware. It has a number of pixel formats. This library features an sRGB mode which yields quantization, and there are operator overloads on the colors. There was no documentation about whether the color space was linear or non-linear. Dear Imgui. Dear Imgui is a bloat-free graphical user interface for C++ with minimal dependencies doesn't support it at all. Alpha blending is wrong by default, treats sRGB and linear colour as interchangeable internally, performing blending on 8-bit values which store sRGB, so it's hard to fix. It exposes a 32-bit colour type in the API, which results in quantization if using an sRGB frame buffer, and again, no documentation about colour. Flash was insanely popular until Adobe quietly put it out to pasture but the official documentation makes no mention of gamma correction. There are 8-bit sRGB colours everywhere that are used like linear colours. It seems there's no support for linear colour or gamma correction whatsoever, nor is there any documentation. You may have come across Unity if you were a game developer. There is no documentation on the colour space here, but assuming this class is meant to store sRGB, LERP is incorrect, and the operators that are provided are incorrect. Assuming this class is meant to store linear colour, the colour constants are all incorrect, and HSV to RGB is also incorrect. Assuming this class is meant to store both, Unity has a global toggle for whether or not the rendering is linear colour or sRGB, which means that the interpretation of colour and the correct operations on it are a runtime choice. And the documentation does not specify the colour space of the default colours. So overall, Unity's colour management is fairly brittle. How about Godot? There is no documentation whatsoever on the colour space. Many of the documentation samples skip over concrete examples that would demonstrate one way or another, or use weasel words to avoid specifying the intent of a function. Now, assuming this class is meant to store sRGB, linear interpolation is incorrect, blending is incorrect, and James checked the source codes to be absolutely sure, and grey is calculated needlessly incorrectly. Assuming this class is meant to store linear colour, most of the constructors and conversion functions are incorrect. Grey is calculated needlessly incorrectly, and from to HSV is incorrect. Also, grey is calculated incorrectly as R plus B plus G, all divided by 3, regardless of the colour space. Lighten and darken are words which are used to imply something very different to what's actually being done. This class is overall very easy to misuse. Let's consider Ogre. There is no documentation whatsoever on the colour space in the official documentation. Assuming this class is meant to store sRGB, all the arithmetic operators are wrong. Assuming the colour class is meant to store linear colour, then the colour conversions are wrong. 
e.g. get as RGBA and git HSB. So overall, this class is extremely likely to be misused. Here's a picture of some cats. Any ideas who painted this? Quite like this picture. It's by Austrian artist Karl Kahler. It's called My Wife's Lovers. It was painted in 1893. Those are Turkish Angora cats. Anyway, it's not great, is it? This is some of the most widely used graphical software, and unfortunately, I'm only halfway through the list. CryEngine. There's a lot going on with CryEngine. James discovered six different representations of colour in CryEngine. We have the usual set of errors. The colour class has arithmetic operators, which can't be, ever be correct for 8-bit integers. Other operators will, will quantize for 8-bit integers. The colour class can never store linear colours, and there is no documentation. If the colour class is sRGB, arithmetic operators are incorrect. sRGB to RGB is lossy for colour TPL over 8-bit over integers. Scale col is probably incorrect. Lerp floats will give unexpected results, and grey is probably incorrect. Now, if the colour class is linear, it provides incorrect packing operators, and to and from HSV is incorrect. More generally, luminance calculation is incorrect in one colour space or the other, and there doesn't seem to be a canonical colour representation that functions take, which means that colour management is ad hoc. Text to screen colour takes a float RGBA, set clear colour takes a VEC3, and set fog colour takes a colour TVL of float, while draw 2D label takes a float, float star. And all of this is in the same class. Some documentation is just wrong rather than absent, and this is a real problem. QT isn't too bad. Q colour seems to be implied to be gamma encoded only, but a closer look brings up the Q colour space class, which allows you to convert 32-bit QRGB values to linear colour. This is not ideal, but you have to really want to shoot yourself in the foot here. QRGB has a Q pre-multiply function, which will produce quantization. Other than that, given that it's a UI toolkit, it seems to handle everything fairly correctly. There's almost no support for linear colour in the API at all, but apparently, internally, it's all linear colour and can be correctly rendered with gamma correction. So let's rush through the rest. In MATLAB, RGB to grey uses an incorrect formula to calculate luminance, which assumes the NTSC colour space. For OpenCV, CVT colour with CV colour RGB to grey uses an incorrect formula to calculate luminance, which again is only correct for NTSC. How about SVG and CSS? Well, both perform blending in the incorrect colour space by design. The website that you see there links to several articles reinforcing the content of this talk. Eric McClure writes, and I'm quoting here, The amazing thing here is that the W3C is entirely aware of how wrong CSS3 linear gradients are, but did it anyway to be consistent with everything else that does them wrong. It's interesting that while SVG is wrong by default, it does provide a way to fix this via colour interpolation. Of course, CSS doesn't have this property yet, so literally all gradients and transitions on the web are wrong because there is no other choice. Even if CSS provided a way to fix this, it would still have to default to being wrong. It seems we have reached a point where, after years of doing sRGB interpolation incorrectly, we continue to do it wrong not because we don't know better, but because everyone else is doing it wrong. So everyone's doing it wrong because everyone else is doing it wrong. A single bad choice done long ago has locked us into compatibility hell. We got it wrong the first time, so now we have to keep getting it wrong because everyone expects the wrong result. End quote. This is a council of despair. Alacrity I'm quoting here, is the fastest terminal emulator in existence, using the GPU for rendering enables optimizations that simply aren't possible without it. Excellent. Sadly, subpixel fonts aren't rendered correctly if sRGB frame buffers are disabled. 
MSYS2 has a command line terminal called Minty. But colour blending seems to be done incorrectly. There's too much colour in the subpixels. But Windows Console, hmm. colour blending also looks incorrect, too much subpixel colour. Microsoft Terminal seems to handle things correctly in clear type mode. I will reserve my strongest praise for Unreal Engine. The colour space is linear by default. There are two colour types, F colour and F linear colour, and there are appropriate operators for converting between them. And there is sufficient documentation to know what's going on. Finally, Linux has historically not had very good sRGB support due to the X window system. OpenGL is underspecified, for example, rendering to an sRGB enabled back buffer. OpenGL and OpenGL ES use different sRGB enabled by default parameters, with OpenGL having sRGB disabled by default and GLES having sRGB enabled by default. This results in bad things happening, e.g. with Imscripten compiled OpenGL. Linux over NVIDIA has a bug where the default frame buffer can't be sRGB. I despair. Here is some despair artwork. Who painted this? Well, this is The Desperate Man by Gustave Courbet, painted around 1842, 1843, around that sort of period. Fortunately, hope is at hand. Who painted this? So this piece is called Giving Thanks After Leaving the Ark. It's by Enrico Morelli. So what to do? So earlier I alluded to the linear algebra proposal. Now this is paper number P1385 and you can visit it on that link. This is an important proposal because it introduces a consistent API and syntax for performing linear algebra. There is another linear algebra proposal in motion which I'll talk about in a moment but this paper is informally called the Syntax Proposal. There are a number of high quality public and private linear algebra libraries in the C++ ecosystem. Unfortunately, they don't interoperate. And if you want to build something universal on them, you're out of luck. If you have to build something that operates with all of these libraries, pff, you, you, oh dear, it's a, it's a lot of work. And as a result, other languages like Python are stealing our lunch when it comes to things like AI. And by creating a unifying syntax, other library maintainers can use the customization points exposed in this paper to add their own optimizations. The goals of the linear algebra proposal are to provide linear algebra vocabulary types, parameterize orthogonal aspects of implementation, by which I mean offer static polymorphism using template parameters. There we are. Offer defaults for the 90% of normal users and customizations for the 10% of power users, provide element access, matrix arithmetic and fundamental operations, manage mixed precision and mixed representation expressions. These last two items are important to a color API. So let's rattle through the nature of linear algebra. It's the branch of mathematics concerning linear equations and linear functions and their representation through matrices and vector spaces. A linear equation is the sum of known coefficients a1 to an, multiplying a series of unknowns x1 to xn. It's fundamental to analytical geometry and linear regression and solving simultaneous equations and many, many other applications. It's fundamental, foundational to much of modern mathematics. Now, a vector is a tuple of scalars. You can perform addition, and the inverse operation subtraction if the operands have the same number of elements. You can multiply by a scalar and you can perform an inner product, also known as a dot product. Vectors can be arranged as row vectors and column vectors. A dot product is performed between a row vector and a column vector of the same number of elements. Now a matrix is a vector of tuples. Again, you can perform addition if they have the same size, along with the inverse operation of subtraction. Now you can also perform scalar multiplication like this. 
Matrix multiplication is a rather more tricky affair and not relevant to the colour proposal. However, rest assured that the linear algebra proposal supports a broad range of applications. Now, those of you who are familiar with the linear algebra domain will have heard of BLAS. This is also the subject of a proposal, number 1673, so it has the name the BLAS proposal. And the idea is to wrap up the C API defined by BLAS inside a C++ API. The BLAS API is battle-hardened through 40 years of use. It's an excellent proposal and is complementary to the syntax proposal. The BLAS proposal and the syntax proposal are both targeting C23. Now, the problem of mixed representation is tricky. C allows you to add a float to a double or a double to an integer. It performs the appropriate conversion silently and lets you get on with things without cluttering up the code. And if it didn't do this, you would be stuck with casting instructions all over your code. Unfortunately, this isn't available for user defined types. And of course it isn't. How would that work? In fact, we already have this problem with the library defined std complex type. If you try and add a complex number of floats to a complex number of doubles, you get a compilation error. In the same way, you might expect the multiplication of a vector of floats by a matrix of doubles to also fail compilation. But our library deals with this in quite a cunning way. It's not necessary for the, for the colour proposal. Um, I'll come back to this in a moment. The proposal also allows for substituting alternative algorithms for particular use cases. For example, if you have a sparse matrix, you may not want to use the regular multiplication strategy. After all, it has a complexity of order n cubed. You might want to use something a little more appropriate for your environment. Perhaps you want to use Strassen's algorithm, which has a complexity of order 2.807. This ability to customise algorithm choices is very useful for a colour proposal. Now, this is a very short summary. I've already spoken at the last two conferences about linear algebra and geometry, and I will be happy to answer questions about linear algebra proposals later. But let's move on. Time for some more art. So this is Spring Sun, Lent is on. Um, it's a castle ruin near Bread Road. Um, I'll give you a clue to who painted this because you might find it quite unexpected. Can you identify this piece? I want the name, because I imagine you can guess who painted it. So this is Tableau 1, painted in 1921 by Pierre Mondrian. Right, well the obvious first question to ask is why standardised colour? Well, it's been a long time since you could buy a green screen or a monochrome monitor. Colour text on a monitor has been available as standard since the last century. All you need to do is power up a Linux shell and type ls to see coloured text in action. It's a very useful cue for differentiating information. So here, blue is for directories and green is for files. Unfortunately, you can't write this in standard C++. You need to bind to a separate colour implementation for your platform. One criterion for considering something for inclusion in the standard library is if it's hard to get right. For example, it is very hard to write concurrent queues, and such an entity is being proposed for specialisation. I am sorry, for standardisation. And it can't come soon enough. As we saw from the earlier parade of misfortune, it seems to be very hard to get colour right. And this is all well and good, but why teach it to C++? Well, there are three use cases that spring to mind immediately. The format library is a great leap forward in text output, but it doesn't handle colour at all. A colour proposal will allow output of colour to the coloured text to the standard output. Next, any serious graphics manipulation software is going to be written in C++. And this is where we have observed most of the problems with colour in C++ software. A colour proposal will reduce the error here. And finally, I have a proposal in flight to introduce a simple drawing library to the standard library. Having colour in the standard, as well as linear algebra, will reduce the bulk of this paper. 
Now, if we're going to have a colour proposal, what are the requirements? We need XYZ support. We need conversion between XYZ derived colour spaces. We need compile time, user defined colour spaces, and runtime, data defined colour spaces. We need to allow ICC profile implementation. It must be strongly typed so that we don't convert incorrectly between type between colour spaces. And it requires high performance without storage or speed overhead, obviously. Ah, American spelling. So basic color space is a tag type like iterator category. And from it, we derive two color spaces, RGB and XYZ. Then we have a basic color model, which tells us how to store colors in the case of XYZ, this is trivial. It's a tuple of three floats. The RGB model is a little more interesting. It might be a tuple of floats or a vince or even a mixture. Alpha is always linear, so it's quite a simple type. So putting these together, we get a basic color type. So this is simply a descriptor class that takes the color space, the color model, and the alpha model as template parameters, and exports a number of symbols describing the space. Now we can create color classes Let's start with the standard RGB space over unsigned 8-bit values without alpha. And we can do the same thing, but with floats. Now we've added alpha there, the final parameter in the template introduction. And we can do that again with floats. Linear RGB looks like this. Linear sRGB space. And with alpha. Lastly, we need an XYZ class, which obviously has no alpha. And finally, we need to be able to convert between things. So here's conversion between alpha models And here's conversion between RGB models. So this beast is for conversion between two arbitrary RGB spaces. And this is for conversion between generic RGB and XYZ. Well, this is the other way around. Recall the transfer function was a simple matrix vector multiplication and a gamma correction function. With linear algebra in the library, we can customize implementations according to use case. If you want something quicker than the absolutely correct function, you can substitute your own function. I'm going to skip over some implementation details and round off this section with the generic convert function that these enable. And that about wraps it up. We looked at identifying colours, how we apprehend intensity and in colour. We looked at a couple of colour spaces and a transfer function. We saw how colour management is widely misapplied. We took a quick look at the linear algebra proposal and then we saw how colour can be used in C++. We looked at the proposed API, and that was it. So, was everything you knew about colour wrong? Thank you. <laughs> now that was something. Um, I'm out of course, especially after the zero
shaming of all the engines and libraries and stuff. So um, how long did it take to run through all the codes and figure out the state of color presentation? Well, I've got to, I, I have to um, call out James Barrow here. He's, uh, he's my co-author. He first brought to my attention the fact that the um, color, the color path, the graphics proposal uh, is, is it's wrong, basically. Uh, and I felt quite mortified because I didn't realize what it was that I didn't know. Uh, so James Barrow said, no, you've got it wrong. And he said, but don't worry, lots of other people have got it wrong. And he was the one who went away and did all the research. Um, and once he got started, he, it, it just became an epic journey for him. Of saying, one of them must be right, surely, he was saying. There must be someone who's got this. And, and it wasn't until he came across Unreal um, that, that, that he found something where he couldn't find any fault. I, I, you know, I don't want to be laying into these people. It's incredibly unprofessional to, to you know, knock other people's code. There's, um, uh, you, you know, we all write the best code we can all the time. Um, and quite often we simply don't know what it is that we don't know. The whole, you know, color space theory is fascinating, but it's very rich and it's a very, very deep rabbit hole. I, I started, you know, going through Wikipedia and, and, and reading about the CIE color spaces. And, and, you know, and that's just the start. There are lots, lots and lots of color spaces have been used and, and have been devised um, for different contexts. You know, you get CYMK color spaces for print, um, uh, which, which is just a whole other area of endeavor. Um, but James, he, he, James is the person who went through all this. I, don't, I honestly don't know how long he spent, but I get the impression it was, it was weeks and weeks. It was, a, it was an odyssey. It was a, you know, a very dark journey into the, into the abyss for him. At least it's only color. At least it's not safety critical software, because obviously safety critical software always works all the time, and we never need to worry about it. Um, I mean, but there's a lot of like critical software that runs through the browsers and use HTML and CSS representation, and now we know for sure <laughs> that there are some caveats lies around. I mean, another question I had: uh, if we I've already gone too deep into the rabbit hole, and now all our perception is wrong. So making it right will make it feel like wrong, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, I don't, you know, I've been thinking about this for, for quite a while. That you know, we we've got it so wrong. Is it has it just been normalized now? Um, but this is about human perception. Uh, I think that once we get it right, it'd be like putting on a new pair of glasses with the correct prescription. You know, if, you, if you're wearing wrong glasses, you know, if, if, if the lenses are wrong, everything looks blurry, but you get used to it. And then suddenly one day you'll put on a pair of glasses and they have the correct lenses and the world is a brighter, clearer, sharper, shinier place. And I imagine that's what will happen when we start correcting color. People just suddenly start noticing smooth well smoother interpolation smoother gradients you know they will actually look correct um so i you know yes we've got a long way down the rabbit hole it's 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 certainly not too late to correct the results but it's going to be you know in some in some domains it's going to be an incredibly long journey to set things right particularly since in some cases for example in css and svg they're actually standards and changing standards is quite a long-winded process, as I'm fully aware of, being on the C++ committee. Um, totally. And we have a question from the chat. I mean, we can always take the professional designer and give him the best monitor available with the best representation of colors. But in yeah. the end, would be the colors showing up on in the UI be pleasing for the end user? Because this is like most of the time, it's the only thing that matters. Uh, I can understand that there are like three groups it would be. The people that don't care, to, care about the colors, but they need, want the best UX UI possible. The second would be the actual representation for the artists and designers that they, uh, for them, the colors do matter the most and they want to be the, as perfect and close to ideal variant as possible. And I get the third one, 
is about like efficiency. For example, for the fast-paced games and shooters and stuff, to be able to differentiate between different colors, and no mat- uh, it doesn't matter actually if the shadows are correct, for example, but as long as you can distinguish between different like pictures and colors and stuff, it's, it's the thing that matters and not like the actual colors. Mm. Um, well, color fidelity uh, has different values in different contexts, obviously. As you say, in a shooter, um, you're not really admiring the precision of rendering of um, shadow blend, shadows blending into the background or blending into other blending onto other textures. Um, so it's not necessarily the sort of thing you would notice. But certainly in Photoshop, for example, in, in, in art programs, and it is really important. And I've seen our artists in our studio with you know, brand new monitors spending a long time calibrating everything to match their lighting conditions, um, which is fine. But the assumption is that everybody else will um, calibrate their monitors to match their lighting conditions appropriately. I don't know anybody other than you know, quite hardcore artists who will spend the time doing that kind of calibration. Um, so, you know, we're, we're back to subjectivity again. All you can really do is hope for the best as an artist and hope that what you can see on your monitor is a, a good expectation of what others will see on their monitor. You can't, it's not, it's not necessarily reasonable to blame the user, but it's the user's fault. Um, so... You know, if, if they're going to create poor, if they're going to create poor lighting conditions to observe their monitors, to, to to view their monitors with, there's not really much we can do, and that's before we even go to you to how they're um, dealing with their own sight. Users have very different sort of qualities of sight. We we already we, you know we have colorblind people, and straight away, unless you're designing for colorblind people, you're excluding a big chunk of your well, I say a big chunk, about eight percent of your uh, of your male population. 8% of, 8% of men have some kind of color blindness condition where, the, the, where, where, for example, they can't quite match color, they can't match colors properly or differentiate, or they have um, an unusual distribution of um, S and M and L cones and things like that. Um, it's very difficult to design for everybody. Uh, and it's an obvious choice for an artist to design for what they think looks absolutely perfect to them, which is fine until you realize there are some people who can't see the same range of colors. Um, You know, this is yet another example of considering diversity and inclusion. You know, you you, you have a diverse set of users with diverse visual skills and abilities. And, you know, the good artist will accommodate all of them, not just the ones that are like him. I I wonder if it's possible to run an on-the-fly calibration like taking into account of from the i don't know from the hardware information about the state of colors presented on the screen and take this into account when we are calculating the colors presenting on the screen or if it's leveraged to the driver side well certainly i remember playing games you know it's even back in the 90s i remember playing games where the first thing that you would do was uh tell the uh, tell the game what how your monitor was set up and you would set the brightness and it would say things like you know hit a key until the image appear, until the image is, is very very faint or is barely visible uh, so that it would give an idea of what your brightness is but i'm sure there are other calibration operations and or, or opportunities available to um uh, assess what your uh, what your color perception is like um it was it, I, you know, I'm just making it up as I go along now, but I'm sure it must be possible to ascertain what the nature of your of your color perception is, you know, algorithmically. I haven't actually done it. It's an interesting field of research. I'd be very interested in collaborating with anybody who wants to wants to research into um, automatic, you know, calibration and detection of users of users' color perception. Right, uh, and I can remember, like, from the early days that on the start you. Had to like manually choose what type of graphics you have right now and the graphic mode mm-hmm. that you want to game run. So it's kind of would on the fly get all the checks. Um, looking back at the math, uh, and that tries to accommodate like for the general use case, 
uh what would yeah. be like options for the colorblind people like how would you tweak the math to uh lend the colors to for the colorblind people um there's no need to tweak the math the math reflects precisely um what the conversion is between two different color spaces now color blindness is a hmm, color blindness is a color space there is a so there is a reduced set of colors available to you which means that you're making a transformation um, between two different vector two different vector spaces um, so there's not necessarily a simple isomorph well there certainly isn't a an isomorphic translation from uh an ordinary you know a standard color space to that which a colorblind person has so any work that's going to be done there is going to have to be done by the designer in the first place um oh i'm just thinking now i don't think there would be an algorithmic way of making a user interface um colorblind friendly um i'm gonna have to think about that so yes, no need to adjust the maths. It's all down to the original designer's input. All right. I mean, from my personal experience, I've played a lot of games. And usually, if they're going down the road of supporting colorblind people, it's usually leveraged to some common cases for colorblindness. And you basically, I don't know, select the type of you had. But uh, none of them would be... Mm, I would say ideal for my case because the colorblindness is a gradient. It's not like the fixed state because we have different yeah. numbers of uh, things in our eyes than different presentation. So it's always like fascinated me for me. But mm. so far, I've only seen cases for let's put I don't know this coefficient to our algorithm and just move all the color to one like extreme side of the space or invert them and not like anything fancy i would say like yeah i think um i think they're not trying hard enough <laughs> if you're doing something like that they're, they're, it's not that there's not one size fits all you know it's not like um clothes sizes sorry no it probably is more like clothes sizes you know you, you don't make one cut of dress and then another cut of a dress for a big girl you know you, you make a range of sizes for different sized right. people. And in the same way, you're going to have to make a range of interfaces or a range of user interfaces to match different people's perception of color. Um, there are some sort of categories, uh, you know, there, 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 are, there are kind of little islands of, of, of types of color blindness. Um, and you can probably, you know, and, and depending on how much effort you as, a, you as a development team want to put in, you can, you can support each of those different types of color blindness. Um, and I'd be, you know, I'd be delighted to see that sort of support. I know that the Last of Us, or Part Two, the Last of Us, they spent a lot of time on accessibility. I'm, I'm not colorblind, at least not as far as I'm aware. Um, so I wasn't, um, I didn't spend much time working, um, you know, playing with their settings for that sort of thing. And also, the Last of Us doesn't have a rich, full, huge, intrusive user interface to play, to 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 deal with anyway. So they're they're kind of fortunate. Um, but it's certainly, and it's, it's an overlooked area of accessibility at the moment. Um, there's a chap called Douglas Pennant, um, who's done talks on colorblindness. Um, at, I think he did one at GDC last year. Um, and, uh, he's certainly worth you know, paying attention to. Also, I sit very close to him in my studio. So, you know, yeah, you know, look, look for Douglas. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Um, but I mean, in the end, if you mentioned the population of colorblind people is like eight percent only, uh, so and out of this eight percent, like how many people are actually like gamers, and from these gamers, how many people would actually buy your game and play? So I guess it's all boils down to the numbers and how much money you would like to spend and how much money you get from the game. Uh, but I mean, well, outside, it's so so I was going to say, it's certainly safe to assume that eight percent of your players are colorblind. You know, since eight, if eight percent of the male population is um, 
color blinds, then sorry, no, hang on. If your game is being played by men only, then eight percent yeah. of them will be color blind. If you've got an even distribution of men and women, then a little more than four percent are color blind. But still, that's no reason to exclude them. Uh, you know, it, they may have there may be low numbers. It's a decision that you, as a game designer, have to make. How much effort do you want to put into accommodating a diverse audience? You know, the diversity of audience that you choose to accommodate is merely a, a reflection of your concern for your audience. Um, there are other um, variations amongst your audience that you that you might want to spend more effort on because it's because it's 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 bigger. Uh, it's it's you know it's 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 part of design. I'm great to see Last of Us Two taking accessibility seriously. You know, there are lots of there are lots of hidden disabilities. You know, the 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 um, There are, there are lots of hidden disabilities, you know, like, like autism, for example. Autism is not is not immediately visible. When you meet somebody in the streets, you don't know that that's a disability that they have. Similarly, with being deaf or being colorblind, that's not immediately visible. But that doesn't mean that it's something that you shouldn't be sort of you know, shouldn't be accounting for when you're you know when you're providing something for consumption by you know by the general public. Uh, all right, I think that was the best ad for Last of Us 2 that I've heard in a while. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I wasn't going, but now I'll buy PlayStation and play Hello. <laughs> no, I'm very impressed with it. And I had nothing to do with it either. <laughs> I mean, uh, as a colorblind person, I would always take any attempt to support my case, but uh, I do understand at the same time that sometimes it's not the best maybe value to put the money in. So <laughs> I kind of would give a green light for studios to sometimes not paying the best detail at that. Um, so let's quick check if we have any more questions from the audience. Um, I guess not. One question I had in my mind is that about the RGB model, and you've mentioned that we are allowed to have a mixture of types stored in the model. I mean, what the use case would be to mix them? Um, you might have... Uh... Oh, actually, that's a good question. John, I'll... I'll... I will get back to you on that. I'm sorry, Alexander. I'm going to, have to, I'm going to have to get back to you on that and discuss that with James. He was quite keen on there being a, a mixture of mixture of uh, RGB representations. It's early in the morning here. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> to me. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, and the last question. Uh, oh, sorry, so, uh, Al alpha is always linear, um, whereas you might have you might have nonlinear. Uh, uh, non-linear element colors, uh, element values. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get back to you on this. I mean, but it's you can have non-linear colors, but the alpha channel is like a separate parameter that's configured yeah. separately, so it has a distinguished. Mm -hmm. All right, so <laughs> we'll get back uh, it for it later. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, you can spe specify that like no alpha. Was RGB, it means that it will uh, skip alpha at all and won't be mentioned in the model and won't occupy any space, like no flag. That's right. Alpha. alpha is used for compositing. Um, so, for example, you know, if you're writing, if you if, if you're simply writing like the F um, Victor Sverovich's FMT library, which has been accepted as C plus plus twenty, doesn't support color um, because the, the, there's no way so to do. But for printing text to a terminal. You don't need alpha because text doesn't layer one on top of the other. You just have a background and then some text on the background, and so there's there's no need for alpha. All right. Um, so I guess it's all for my question right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can transition to the Zoom team and talk okay. a bit. Yeah. So right. yeah. It was really mind-bending talk for such an early hour here too. <laughs> it's yeah, you start, start your day from any like algebra is <laughs> <laughs> something special if you are not a hardcore game developer. 
But as I see, uh, there is no, like, from colorblind people and people with a, some kind of disabilities, the only way you can solve their issue is by designing stuff with simple scholars. But, and for game dev, I, I have a, like, I think that the state of that is that it's from one point if, is that it's pretty complicated and from another that uh, if it looks good, it is good. <laughs> Sometimes it just applies that way. That's why all that game engines and frameworks are lacks, lacking that part of yeah. the research. And your work is really, really important to make it clear and set it in one place because all, most of the game engines are developed in C++ and people struggle to find correct solution to their questions because yeah they just try and fast and find fast <laughs> fitting in solution to convert from hsv to rgb and a lot of examples out there are wrong i tried myself and if you don't spend like several days or a week trying to get your head into that it's really easy to make a mistake so it, the, it, it, yes. <laughs> This is really mistake we made. Yeah, so, so I hope that the in... more serious will have a correct color representation. <laughs> in so I hope that twenty three, the standard of the C plus plus twenty three will help us with that <laughs> to make it well, more clear. Linear algebra will be a start, I hope. Um, it, it'd be nice to get color in for C plus plus twenty three, but uh, you know, time is marching on, and the committee is running a little more slowly than usual because obviously we can't meet face to face. Uh, so I think C plus plus twenty three will be a much smaller change than C plus plus twenty was to seventeen. So, um, yeah. but you know, I'm, I'm I'm still hoping linear algebra will get in. I'm hoping to have another pa paper in the next mailing uh, next week. Hmm. Yeah, will be cool. Uh, anyway. C++ 20 introduced a lot of stuff <laughs> and we'll oh, yeah. have additional three years then <laughs> to slowly uh, learn that mm -hmm. without all the dramatic changes in the next release. Yes. 23 will certainly be quieter. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to hear that because I did not... <laughs> I mean, my... so long to wait. Sorry, uh, we won't have so long to wait for a compliant compiler either. We still don't have a C++ 20 compiler. Oh, um, so, okay, uh, it's time for the next blog. Thank you, guys. It was really impressive, <laughs> and my mind still hurt my a little. But yeah, <laughs> I hope that everybody enjoyed that math <laughs> and this uh, frozy autumn day. So uh, we're gonna have the next blog in thirty minutes, and now is pause, and you can. Enjoy the partners' videos. See you in the zoo. Cheers.